my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able 
I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Isn't God good? you guys so much i'm a man just a thank you michael for leading music i appreciate that when, when we're singing that song uh, we'll i'll tell you this here in a second i've been doing like a uh, this is going to lead directly into the sermon i've um, been doing like a an un, unknowing kind of study of john a little bit in my personal bible study um and uh, that's, uh at our church i I'll, I'll talk about what a next gen pastor is if if you don't mind for a second I, I don't know what it is either that's just a title that they've given me Essentially, I've been there ever since I left here at Trinity, uh, so 2006, and I've been at Hot Springs Baptist now for 17 years. I'm not counting the four years I was there before I came to Trinity, so, so really what they've done is they've run out of things to call me, and so they just kind of created new things, and so Next Gen is what they call me now, um, but, but in that, I, uh, I get to lead uh, practically with, with, with ministering with people. I get to lead college, our college students, and we've got a small community college there right close to our church. And then I get to, uh, to minister to some of our young singles who are there as well. So I do a Bible study with those guys at, at, on Wednesday nights, and we're going through the book of Revelation. And uh, about every six weeks or so, five, six weeks, I, uh, I preach in, in, our, in our main service on Sunday morning. And um, I'm, I'm a, kind of a simpleton, so I've just been slowly preaching through the book of 1 John. And so those two things together, right, John has been, been weighing on my heart and my mind a lot here lately. And so if you have a Bible and you want to open up to the book of 1 John, that's where we're going to be in chapter 3. I haven't preached this sermon before, so if it's just an egg, I'm going to go home and rework it so that the next time, right, that, that I get to preach on a Sunday morning, right, that we'll get there. But, uh, but what brings it up in mind, this song, All My Life You Have Been Faithful, I don't know how many of you are, are nerds like I am, but I love church history. Uh, I love the study of it. I love um, I'm just reading about those guys. And, and that song reminds me of a man, and maybe you've heard of him, probably you haven't. His name is Polycarp, who, uh, who lived probably about 150 A.D. His, uh, uh, the man that led him to the Lord was, um, was led to the Lord by the Apostle John. That's the connection that we're, that we're making here, uh, a man named Irenaeus. And anyhow, so Polycarp lived in a town called Smyrna, if you've read your Bible and in the book of Revelation, you recognize the name Smyrna. That's the town that's in there. And uh, Polycarp uh, lived to be 86 years old. And the reason that we know he lived to be 86 years old is because when he was 86, uh, persecution of the church became very heavy in the town that he lived in. And uh, this, I promise you, this is all going to connect here. Um, persecution got very heavy. And they started uh, killing believers, right? Christians that lived in that area, they started killing them just for being believers. And a Polycarp was 86 years old, and he was very well known and very well respected in the city. And as this persecution was going on, the, uh, the pagans, right, the, the non-believers who were kind of the rulers of the city, uh, realized that if they were going to follow through with their instructions to get rid of the Christians, they were going to have to do something with Polycarp. Uh, this man who everyone knew and loved and had just been a wonderful man for his entire life, all 86 years. And so they developed a plan and they decided that what they were going to do is they were going to come to Polycarp and they were going to tell him, Polycarp, if you just deny the Lord, then all, everything else, just deny him to us and you can keep doing everything that you've always done. We're not going to go any further than that, just deny him. And you can just live out the rest of your days as the polycarp, right? You could probably still keep working in your church, and these, but just deny him, and then we can go. And there's a very famous quote that is attributed to him where he looks at them at 86 years old, and he says, For 80 and 6 years, the Lord has been faithful to me. Who am I to not be faithful to him? And when you sing this song, right, all my life you have been faithful, that, that just came into my mind of 80 and 6 years, You've been faithful. He has been faithful to me. Who am I to not be faithful to him? And so they took him and they burned him and he gave up his life. And I know that there are a lot of us, you guys here, who you, you're, you've lived lives of faithfulness. 
And um, just a word that doesn't have to do with our text this morning, but man, keep going to the end. 80 and 6 years, 80 and 9 years, 90 and 5 years, whatever it is. Can't you say, when you sing songs like that, that the Lord has been faithful to you? And who are we at at the end to say, Lord, I'm not going to be faithful to you? I mean, man. All right, well, my my four-year-old back there is bedtime at 7.15, so I'm going to go ahead and we'll pray now after that. And uh, we'll start heading our way back to Hot Springs, and <laughs> we'll go from there. But yeah, I just, I don't know, that was just laid on my, laid on my heart as we were singing that song. Um, I, I will um, share with you a little bit. Uh, Next Generation, like I said, one of the things that I get to do at our church, which is really cool, I, uh, when I left here at Trinity, I went back as our junior high pastor. I uh, then became our student pastor, uh, then the college pastor, and now I'm kind of, like I said, over college young adults, and then also I'm, um, I'm kind of over our areas from preschool to basically young families. So if you're zero to 45 and you've got kids, I'm pretty much the guy that, that works with that area at our church. And it really is just an awesome blessing. I'm, I'm just, I just enjoy it so much. And, and literally every day we go, oh, I guess that's something that a guy with the title next generation pastor should do. And so, so it really, really, really is fun there. Um, I do want to say this to you, if you don't mind. Um, and another thing on singing this song is, uh, I'm going to stand pretty still tonight because, um, if, if you wanted me to roam around, then I apologize for that. But I have, uh, for about a month now, been experiencing some really crazy eye issues in my right eye. So everyone sitting on this side, I have no idea if you're going to fall asleep. So this is the side that you're going to want to be on. If you just get tired and you just need to lay down or something, that's the side to be this side. I'm sorry. I got you. Got you right here, but this side. So, so anyhow, if, uh, if you ever do in your time of prayer want to say a prayer for Tad, I've got to go meet a specialist in Little Rock here next Monday to find out what's going on in there and see if we can get that stuff figured out. It could be something very small, minute, or it could be something pretty major. We're just going to trust the Lord on that as well as we go through. But, um, but so if, if you've got your Bible at 1 John chapter 3, um, we just have a tradition at our church, and I hope you guys don't mind. If, if you wouldn't mind standing while I read you this passage, I'm going to read uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 18. Um, and we can just go through this together. How about that? For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if this world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and our sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. And everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Now this is how we know that we have come to know love that he laid down his life for us. And we should also lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Uh, As you're sitting down, I I do just need to say this church is very special to me. I thank you for how you guys have loved me over the years. Um, uh, Andy, by the way, Andy is way better at doing announcements than I ever was when I was a student minister here. So you guys hang on to him because some of you who were around back then, you're like, yep, we we definitely upgraded when we got Andy there. So (laughs) so 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 he's a pro in that. But um. But also, this church, of course, not only did I get to serve here as a student minister, uh, 2004, 2005, but also I came to church here when I was in um, uh, probably third, fourth grade, third, fourth, fifth grade. Uh, Miss Erlene Johnson was my Sunday school teacher. Um, Just a wonderful, wonderful lady. We actually lived down the road from her. We lived on Canterbury Street, just right down the road right there. And then we lived on Border Street, too. And um, so, yeah, this church is very special. Brother Mike uh, at Temple Baptist down on Highway 67 actually baptized me when I was eight years old. So lots of connections with this church with Brother Mike. And I'm just so, so, so thankful for you guys. Uh, you, you really do mean a lot to me. And I, I hope, hope you guys know that. Um, but let me just go ahead as, as we dive into God's word here, just to catch you up on this story um, and what's going on in the book. First of all, is this is that when John's writing this letter, what he's doing is, is as you read through it, there are a lot of comparing and contrasting that goes on. John is going to compare the truth and the darkness, or I'm sorry, truth 
and a lie. And he's going to compare light and darkness. And what's going on in this church, uh, this church is Ephesus, by the way, it's on the western side of what's modern day Turkey. It's just right there, right on the Mediterranean Sea. At this time, John has been exiled. He's on the island of Patmos. He's writing to them. And if you read this letter, you notice that ultimately that over and over and over again, he refers to this church as his little children. Right. And, and I, I believe that he refers to this church as, as their little children because he loves them so much that he views himself as their father, as their spiritual father, and he has such a deep love for them that he says, little children. Now, a lot of you in here, I'm sure, have children. And, and maybe that will help you understand the feeling that John has when he's writing to these people through the power of the Holy Spirit, when he says, my little children, I want you to hear this, right? And it's also helpful for us, right? Because we know that ultimately it's not John who's writing this letter, but it's the Holy Spirit who's speaking through him from God our, God our Father, and that when we hear this, we can hear God say, little children, I want you to know this. Little children, you need to hear this. And so as John here is writing to his little children, the other thing we need to know is that this church had been going through some very difficult struggles. There had been a group in the church who had risen up and they had begun to teach things that were false. They had begun to teach lies. They had begun to, begun to deceive people. And they had begun to lead people astray. And there was a battle spiritually going on in this church. And so John, their good father, is writing to them. He says, little children, don't pay attention to these people. You know what is the truth. And you know what the truth has been from the beginning. And what the truth from the beginning is, is the exact same now. And so he's writing to them saying, you know the truth. Now, I, and to be honest with you, I don't know a whole lot about Trinity Baptist Church right now. I, uh, Brother Mike didn't call me up and say, here's something that I want you to preach about. But there may be some of us here tonight who are going through a battle, who are going through a hard time, who are going through a difficult time. There may be someone where, where it just seems like we're fighting or we're rubbing against one another. And we've known by experience, even if you don't find yourself there now, that the great temptation of battles and struggles and difficulty with one another is becoming hard, isn't it? it, it it's having your heart become hard. And so in here, I believe that John, as we read into this section, knows this and realizes this about this very common aspect of the human nature is that when we battle, we begin to harden our hearts towards one another. Not just the people that we have the battle with. But we begin to close ourselves off, don't we? And we begin to build up those walls and build those hedges around us so that we don't get hurt any longer. So, so that we don't uh, find ourselves in a situation where we can be wronged again. And as John writes this, he's been saying, and you know God's command, you know the command of Christ follows Christ's command and as he gets here, he finally tells us what is this command that Christ has given us in this context of these fighting people whose church has let them down, where they've been hurt and they've been deceived and their brothers and their sisters have been warring against one another and they've closed up their hearts to each other. You know, um, well, I'm not even going to go there, sorry. Well, let's do it since I brought it up. If you've read Revelation, you know the very first church that, that's written to is the church of Ephesus. It's this exact same church here, right? And if you, if you read through there, then, then you see very soon, right, where Jesus says, I've got all these things that I, that I appreciate about you. He commends them on certain things. Well, then he has a rebuke. And what's the rebuke that he has? To go back to how you loved it first, Right? Now, whenever you read that, I've always, I'd always assumed that, that the loving that he, at first, that he had talked about was loving God. But as I, like I said, as I've been de facto studying John in Revelation and in his letters, I'm becoming more and more convinced that the love that they've lost is their love for one another. Even if you read that first letter there, you see they're doing all the right things as far as heretics go, as far as people teaching truth, right, as far as people teaching lies. They've kicked them all out of the church. But then he says, love, that's what you've lost. 
I don't know, maybe that's just Tad there. You can write that down, throw that away. But let's get back into the Scripture here. And as we look here for this message in verse 11, for this is the message that you have had from the beginning, that we should love one another. See, what he does here is he starts off, and like I said, he's going to tell them finally, here's what you need to know. Here's what this great command is of following Jesus, is that we should love one another. It's been the same since the very beginning. How many of us, when we grew up, we all sang the song, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Right? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. I sing that song to our four-month-old. She smiles and she spits at me and then we have to change a nappy. That's just what we do. Right? But, but because I want to instill in her, right, that he loves us. And this theme, this, this, uh, this statement that we're to love one another is, is one of the great themes of the Bible. Right? If you read the book of Deuteronomy, you see there what? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, but also love your neighbor as yourself right and then we come to jesus he says um he says to love one another as i love you greater love has no man than one that lays down his life for his brother right and then as we read paul right in first corinthians chapter 13 the great love chapter he says faith hope and love but of these three love remains love is the great theme of the bible We focus on God's love for us, but we cannot forget our love for one another. Our love for our fellow brothers and sisters of the church who are closer than our blood brothers and our blood sisters if we all belong to the Lord. We love one another. And so maybe you're asking yourself at this time, well, what kind of love is this? Because obviously this is a different kind of love. What kind of love is this? And then maybe you go on further and you say, do I love in this way? What kind of love is this? Do I love in this way? And finally, how can I love in this way? And those are all wonderful questions to ask. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to pause for a moment because we need to keep going in the passage. okay? but just keep those in mind. What kind of love is this? How do I love like this, right? And is this my love that I have for one another? Because as we move on here in verse 12, you can follow along with me, right? Uh, John says, he says, we should love one another unlike Cain, who was the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. You see, We look at this and we see that there is a comparison that's being set here in the Bible. And maybe we're not maybe it's a little difficult for us to catch because it's a very extreme comparison, isn't it? Right. John says, look, if you're a believer, if you follow Jesus Christ, if he is the Lord of your heart, then you are to love one another. And how are you to not love one another? Do not love one another like Cain. Now, with this crowd, I'm going to assume that almost all of us here know the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, Unfortunately, um, I've worked with students for a while, and and that's a story where I would have to say, now, this is the story of Cain and Abel, right? Um, It's a funny funny story, sad story, but but has a great outcome. One time, I I was teaching our students at our church, and I said, okay, now we're going to talk about Moses for the next four weeks. So who can tell me about Moses? And one brave soul, right after the others all said their stuff about Moses, one brave soul raised his hand and he said, Tad, I have no idea who Moses is. And he was like a 17-year-old and he had never heard of Moses, a 17-year-old in the South. Praise God, he got saved, he became a missionary, awesome stuff, wonderful things there. But, you know, we understand that we live in a culture now where we can't assume that people know who Moses is. And we can't assume that people know who Cain is. Right. And we can't assume that they know the story of Cain and Abel, how Cain is jealous of his brother when they both bring their offerings to the Lord. And in his jealousy and in his envy, he murders his brother. And what John says here, he says, believers, you are to love one another unlike Cain. Right. So he brings it in. He, right, and, and we think we say, well, that is very extreme because surely the option in this world is not to love your brother and sister or to murder them. Doesn't that seem like quite the extreme? It does, doesn't it? But is that not 
the extreme that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, if one of you hates your brother, then what have you done? Murdered him. So this isn't an extreme that John's come up with. This is an extreme that's come out of Jesus' own mouth, where he says, your options here right, are to love in a way where you love your brothers and sisters, or if you fall into hatred, you may as well have murdered them. Very extreme, right? Totally complete different sides of the spectrum. So Cain harbors this envy. He harbors this jealousy. And in that, he lost his love for his brother. And that's our great temptation. That's the great struggle that we have to, to, to be careful with. Is that in our, in our pain, in our jealousy, in our envy, right? in, in our being broken, in our being wronged, that we don't lose our love for one another. That, that, we don't, that we don't find ourselves on this far extreme that we never, ever dreamed we could ever be on. Because that's how sin works. It normally doesn't work where it says, one day I'm here and everything is sunshine and roses, and the next day I find myself on the far side. Right? We, we know and we understand that sin works in little steps. right? And that one day you do something. And you never would have thought you would have done it. But then you're like, well, that wasn't so bad. And then, then you do a little further. And then you do a little further. And a little further. And soon you wake up and you look up and you say, how in the world did I get this far? This is where I was. This is where I was happy. This is where I had rest. This is where I had peace. But sin, without my even knowing it, even though I was the one doing it, has taken me from here all the way over here. Had I known at the beginning that sin would lead me here, I never would have gone. But the devil's a liar, isn't he? He says, it's okay. Just a little step. Just a little step. Just a little step. And then you wake up and you have no idea how you got where you are. That's how why we can have this extreme. that says, brothers, love one another. Unlike Cain, who murdered his brother. I'm sure Cain didn't wake up one day and said, you know, my goal in life is to one day murder my brother. No. Sin, jealousy, envy, step by step by step until he found himself in a place where he never dreamed he would have gone doing things he never dreamed he was capable of. But because he just succumbed to sin, succumbed to sin, succumbed to sin, he lost all love and found himself in deep hatred. And so John's writing to this church and he says, you've got to be wary of this. You've got to watch out for this. You've got to be careful that in all of your battles, you remember to love. That in all of your battles, you remember to love. So in verse 13, we have our first imperative. We have the, com we have the command that comes in this passage. And he says this, John writes, he says, Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Right. The command that he has in this passage, I love it. It's not go out and love. It's not go out and do good works. But what is the command? Don't be amazed. He says, you should know by now that this world hates you. Now, I don't know, but maybe some of us have figured this out. that This world hates us. Do not be amazed by that. This world hated Jesus to the point that it put him on the cross and it nailed him there and he died. This world hates us because it hates Jesus. Right? This world is not our home. We shouldn't find this shocking. It's been the same thing for two millennia now. This love hates us. The same passion that fueled Cain, the same sin that led Cain into murder, rules this world. Right? It's funny because whenever we think about love, right, our world is all about love, isn't it? Right? Whenever, you, whenever you read the news, you read the paper, you talk to someone, it is. It is love, 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 love. Love is what it's all about. But I've been reading a man, he's, a, he's an early 20th century uh, Roman Catholic, uh, don't shoot me, um, named G.K. Chesterton. And one of, his, one of his great quotes in the book that I've been reading, it's called Orthodoxy. It says this, it says, the, the, one of the strongest... Uh, one of, the, one of the more things to watch out for in Christianity 
is not our vices, right? We all know the vices. Don't drink, don't chew, don't hang with girls that do, right? We know those kinds of things. He says, but our virtues, that, that if we divorce our virtues from the truth, then they can run even more wild and be even more destructive than, than our vices ever could. And, and so and, and we see that in the world, don't we? We see that the great Christian virtue of love that we're talking about, if pulled from the truth, what happens? It runs crazy. It runs wild. Everything is all about love and love and love and love and love. But what do we know about it? We know that it's a different kind of love, isn't it? And so that's why I ask you to ask that question earlier on, to, to ask that question to yourself that says this, what kind of love are we talking about here? Verse 13, I'll read it for you again. I'll go through 14 here. And it says, do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if this world hates you. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. This, the one who does not love remains in death. He says that this love for, that we have for one another, not only is it, is it an action that we take, but rather it's a sign to us. We should, if we're having a difficult time loving one another in our church and in our church family, then we should seriously ask ourselves, what's my relationship like with the Lord? If I can't love my brother, if I can't love my sister, even though I disagree with them, even though we have some, some things that, that we struggle with, if I can't love them, then am I truly loving the Father? That's the big question that he's asking here. He says, but the one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother and sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing within him. Now, 16, he's going to give us this answer for this question that we have, right? What kind of love is this? We've talked about how our love, our world loves so long as we all love the same way. Have we realized that? Have you noticed that? That as long as you love like the world loves, then you are okay. But there will come a moment when either you will change or the world will change what their definition of love is. And at that moment, if you don't change along with them, then what happens? Then you have become the one who hates. Right. See, see what it reveals to us and what this passage reveals to us, that there's a different kind of love that we're talking about here. And this passage goes in for it and it goes further in this. It says in verse 16, it says, this is how we have come to know love. If I can nerd out on you one more time, I know only, I only get one of those and I did that. I spent it when I talked about polycarp, but I want to bring it back into you here. We, we've got two different words for no that are coming in here. Uh, the first one that, that we've seen is this word called nosco, right? Whenever, you, uh, whenever we spell no, K-N-O-W, that actually comes from that kind of Greek nosco right there. And this is a kind of love that is an awareness. It's like, I am aware that... Um, well, I'll just do this for you. When I was in third grade, I think I went to this church. I played exactly one game of peewee football for the Bitten Vikings. And we were playing at the old football field that used to be in between Angie Grant Elementary School and the high school. I don't even think that's there any longer. They've probably put something there now, right? And I was playing there and I was in one down and I knew in my brain that it was going to hurt whenever I got hit. Right. One down of football. And then we moved to Perrin. We didn't even have football. Right. We played basketball and that was just kind of what we did. Right. But I knew that when I got hit, it was going to hurt. I was aware of that. But then I got in for one down. My very first and last play of organized football in the third grade. After the snap, I was a lineman and I took a helmet right to the middle of my pads right where the little shoestring was holding those together and fractured my sternum. First play ever, only play ever of organized football. And in that moment, I experienced the other kind of no that this passage is talking about. The other no in this passage is a no of experience. See, the no sco is where I am aware that this can hurt. Right. The uh, I believe it's Oido. Oida is the one that comes in here. And this no 
is experiencing that pain. And that's what I did that day, right? I was there, I was lined up, one down, hut, smack, ugh, out. Never played again because I experienced the pain. I knew it could hurt, but then I experienced it. And this is what John's saying here. He says, look, you know what love is, right? We know how we're supposed to love one another with our minds, but we have now experienced this love. Now, I'm sure in this room, if we could stand up right now and we could raise our hand and we could all testify, we could say, let me tell you about a time when I didn't just know love, but I experienced love. Let me tell you about a time when, when everything was looking dark and my church family huddled around me and they circled around me and they held me up when I couldn't find any light. Well, let me tell you about a time when it looked like everything was going to crash in. And they said, we're here for you. We're your brothers. We're your sisters. And together we're going to do this. See, that's the experiential love that's being talked about here. And where does it come from? Well, this is what he writes. He says, this is how we've come to know, how we've come to experience love, that he laid down his life for us. See, I don't know if we recognize that or not, if we've made the connection between our brains and our hearts, if we travel that 18 inches, right? Where we go from just knowing love to experiencing love, and we say, here is how he's loved us. Because he laid down his life for me. And he laid down his life for you. And because he did that, you have experienced his love. You've experienced it. It's not just something that you're aware of. It's not just something that you've read about, that you study, that someone has told you about. But you can sit and you can think and you can say, I know the goodness of God. I have experienced it real and personally in my life. And now... Because of this, we should lay down our lives for our brothers and our sisters. Because you've experienced his love, his laying down his life for you. This passage, right, this translation, this is the CSB. It says you should lay down your lives for your brothers and sisters. Some of your, um, some of your translations, if you're reading, I believe King James would say ought here. I think the NIV says that as well. If you're reading uh, the... Um, uh, one translation, I think the New American Standard says, oh, right? If you look at it into the Greek, it's stronger than any of those words. It's obligated. It says, because I've experienced his laying down his life for me, then I am obligated to lay down my life for my brother and for my sister. Think about it in this way, if I could read it for you. And this is how I've come to experience love, that he has laid his life down for us. And we are obligated to lay our lives down for our brothers and our sisters. That's kind of big, isn't it? That, that when we look out in our room, when we look out at the people who we go to church with, who are our brothers and our sisters in Christ. And, and we can even think church at large, but man, don't we do that a little too much sometimes? We need to think individuals. We need to see faces. We need to see hearts. We need to see people that we care for. And we need to understand that the Bible says you're obligated to love them just like Christ did. They're your family. They're your brothers. They're your sisters. You're obligated to lay down your life for them. Why? Because Christ laid down his life for you. See, this love that we're to have, what's the difference? Ours is a selfless love. Ours is a love that says it's all about you. It's not about me. That's the difference between our love and the, the love of the world. The love of the world is not about you. The love of the world is about me. And as soon as you don't love me in the way that I want you to love me, then I say you don't love me anymore. But the Christian love is me looking at you saying, I love you. What do you need? It's a deeper love, isn't it? Because that's the love that Christ had. That's the love that Christ showed us. That's the love that each and every one of us in here who follow him as our savior have personally experienced that we love him because he loved us first. Doesn't that mean a lot when you think about the people who are different from us, from, from the people who come from different backgrounds. And we know that we have the charge and the obligation to say, I will love them. 
They may not love me, but I will love them. I believe this is one of the great problems in our world. I don't want to get on a box with you here. But, but just how divided is our world? How divided is our society? You know, um, it's just crazy to me how we divide ourselves into so many camps. And it's so easy for us to say, I can love these people, but I'm not going to love those people. I can love the Republicans, but I'm not going to love the Democrats. I can love the black folks, but I'm not going to love the white folks. I can love these people, but I'm not going to love them. Well, we don't have that option. We don't. God's word says, look, this is how we've come to know love, that we lay down his life, that he laid down his life for us so that we should lay down our lives for the brothers and the sisters. It goes even deeper because he's just not giving words here in 17. If anyone has this world's goods and sees his fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in him? Here's what that verse is saying, and I'll say it to you quickly here. It says, look, if you can help someone, if you can help a brother and a sister, and you choose not to, right? That's what that phrasing there, uh, closing up, uh, let me read, I'm sorry, the, the eyeball thing here. If he sees, the, he sees a fellow believer in need, but withholds compassion from him, what that, what that says literally is shuts up his inward parts. If you can see someone and you can look them in the eye, an individual, and say, you're my brother, you're my sister, I hope you're doing okay, I know that you've got a struggle, and I can help with that struggle, but I'm not going to, then John asked a rhetorical question. See, I asked you, I, had, I planted the question in your mind earlier, what kind of love is this? John has, has, has the actual question here, that if you can do that, then he asked the rhetorical, how does God's love reside in him? If you can sit here and you can say, here's my brother and my sister and they're struggling. Here, here's a lady who I've known and I've gone to church with forever and she is homebound now and she just can't get out. And I know that it would make her life if I just went over there and just visited for an hour or 30 minutes or just called her on the phone. And you can do that because you've got the time and you say, no, I'm not going to. Or, or if you see someone who, who, who's gotten behind, maybe they've been laid off of work or something, and, and you say, you know, I could probably help them, but instead I'm just going to say, I hope things work out for you. Then the question here is, how does God's love reside in him? See, that's the question that you should go home and think about. That's the one that, that, that John's given us here to think of. As we go out, we say, you know, this kind of love is a little bit different than the love that we normally see in television, than the love that we see in movies, than the love that we see that's lovey-dovey, I feel like I want to love you. This is a deep, self-sacrificing, mandatory love from the believer that says, I'm committed to you even when you're not committed to me. Because that's the love that Christ has for us, isn't it? He says, I'm committed to you, I'm loyal to you, even on your worst day, I love you. And as a church, we should all look at one another and say, you know what? A lot of us have gone to church together for a long time. And I've seen you on your good days. I've seen you on your bad days. But no matter what, I choose to love you like Christ has chosen to love me. That's the love that he's speaking of. And we'll close with this in verse 18. Little children. Do you see where it comes in? This is, this is their spiritual dad here. Little children, let us not love in word or speech. But let us love in action and in truth. He says, little children who've been fighting battles, who've been struggling with difficult times, right? Who've been burned by members of your own church, who've been burned by your brothers and burned by your sisters. Don't just love in word. Don't just say, I love you. See you later. Slap them on the rear. Send them out the door. But love how? Love in action and in truth. Love is doing. Love is saying, I'm going to love you like Christ. And how did he love? He didn't just tell me that he loved me. He showed me that he loved me. And because he showed me that he loved me, I'm going to show you that I love you. God's gifted me. I'm able to do it in this way. And so I'm going to. I'm going to love you in my deeds. I'm going to love you in my action. I'm going to self-sacrifice for you. See, the world, the world's never going to sacrifice for you. They're just not. Because that's not what they're about. They're about me and me and me. But Jesus is not about himself. 
right? What does it say in Colossians? That he laid aside the Godhead, right? That, that though existing in the form of equality, did not consider the Godhead as something to be grasped. He laid it aside, took on flesh, came to this earth, died on the cross for you and for me. And that's the love that we're to live. The love that says, you know, I have every right to hold this grudge. I have every right to say this is my way. I have every right to say you're wrong. I'm right. But I'm not going to. I'm going to love you. I'm going to swallow my pride, even though everything in all of my body tells me that I'm right. I'm going to humble myself and love you the way that Christ loves me. Because he is my example. And I'm not just going to tell you that I love you. I'm going to show you that I love you. In deed and in truth. What's truth? It's righteous. It's based on scripture. It's based on the teaching. As we read in the very first verse, it's the, it's the love that you've heard from the beginning. This is the love. This is the example of Jesus. So once again, I ask you a couple questions, and these are questions that you're going to need to ask yourself. What kind of love do you have? Have you found yourself so beaten up, so wronged, maybe even rightfully so, that you've built walls and you're blocking that love? Or do you realize, you know, I've got a love. Not this flippant, flimsy love of the world that's here today, gone today, that they make movies about that's just terrible. But a real, deep, genuine, honest, with everything that is with me to everything that you are kind of love. Do you have pride that needs to be swallowed? Or there may be relationships in this room and you might sit on different sides just because you've got something going on. Well, as a believer, you should fix that with love as we go through. Are there needs that you can meet, that you can do, that can show your love? Can, are there sick folks in your church that need a phone call? Are there men and women who used to come and, and be sitting in this room every single time the doors were open, who now would just love it if someone called them up or came and sat on the porch and just said, let's just talk for a while. Man, isn't that nice sometimes? Just to get a phone call from a friend even if you haven't spoken to them in a long time. Two days ago, I was traveling up the, uh, traveling up the interstate. I was going to float to Buffalo with some folks, and, and I got a phone call from my buddy. Some of you would know him, Dustin Wills, who lives over in Malaysia now. He said, hey, what you doing? Which for him, it's like 10 p.m. Right for me, it was like 7 a.m. Hey, what you doing? I said, well, I'm just driving. He said, let's talk. And we talked. And he said, let me tell you about my life. And I got to share him with some of the things going on with me. Man, it was just good to talk to him. That's showing love. Is there someone that you can take care of who can't take care of themselves? That's showing love. That's what Christ did. And that's what he calls us to do as well. I thank you all. I really do. I love this church. I love you all. This church is, means a ton to me. It really, really does. So if I can pray for us now, then I'll turn it over here to Michael and we'll just go and do whatever we need to do. But let me pray for us. Our Father and our God, we pray and we ask, Lord, that we love one another. Not in the cheap, flimsy, selfish love of the world, but with the selfless love of our Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray if there's someone in this room who doesn't know you as Savior, that tonight, just in hearing, they've heard that you love them on their worst day. And that they would turn their heart to you. That they, would, that they would repent of their sin. They would confess you as Lord. And that they would follow you as Savior. Lord, I pray if there's someone here who has an issue with a brother or a sister. That they realize through your word, not through mine. That that's not how we love one another. That we love one another deeply. And sometimes that means swallowing our pride. And saying, I want to love you like Jesus loves me. I pray that our love goes beyond our words and into our actions, in our deeds, and in truth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.